as we exchanged in the emails, like we've been on this series for the last three weeks, or, or this is our third part of the series uh, going off your book and the other book by Father Daniel Fanus, um, which has been very enlightening for the life of Pope Corillus. And so it is great to have you here with us. Um, Thank you. I'm uh, really looking blessing. forward to your sharing. Um, and please, if you would just open us in a prayer and, and, and share. Sure, when absolve me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Lord, for all things. We thank you for the great blessing of our gathering this afternoon. We ask you, Lord, to be in our midst, to guide our conversation, and to open our hearts and minds, and to give us renewal and conversion of life in a way that glorifies you all the days of our life through the intercessions of the Most Holy Mother of God, St. Mary, St. Pope Carlos VI, and all the saints. Hear us when we pray, thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, please um, uh, feel free. I think there's some questions that, uh, that I, I understand are being reserved to the end. Um, so feel free to ask um, or comment on anything that we discussed together. I know you've been uh, covering the theme of the life and and um, the virtues of, of this great saint for some weeks now. So um, I hope I'm not repeating, uh, you know, points that you've covered already. But what I what I wanted to do is try to um, maybe speak a little bit about the importance of this saint to our generation um, and, and speak a little bit about some aspects of his spirituality that aren't sort of the, the, um, the, the aspects that we always sort of kind of jump and say about him, like he's the man of prayer, he's, um, you know, the liturgical, you know, the, the man of the Eucharist. All these, of course, are being very, very true, but I wanted maybe just to look at uh, using some um, points from the book um, that, that I, I wrote this past year, um, maybe just look at his influence on our spiritual life and the, and this um, the importance of him for our generation from a few different angles. So I, I guess the first thing I want to say is that you know the study of the lives of the saints is so important for us as Orthodox Christians. And um, I remember one um, well-known sort of abbot and author. Uh, in the Russian tradition, who said that he noticed that those who made the most progress in the spiritual life were those who read the lives of the saints the most. Um, of course, in addition to the scriptures, he's not saying instead of the scriptures, but but and I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. That the 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 fruit of of being exposed to the lives and writings of the of the saints of the church are so instructive um, in how they inspire us to live out the gospel. And you know, there are some expressions that I always remember in reading some of the lives of the saints and how they are a sort of incarnation, another incarnation of Christ among us. They're, they're another experience of Christ dwelling in, in our unique generation and situation and culture. And the, the beautiful thing about the saints is that they're all unique and yet they're all like God. They're all, they're all individually unique from one another, but they're all at the same time like Christ. And it, and it shows us sort of the, this potential that each one of us has to grow in holiness, to grow in, in sanctification um, according to our personalities, according to our circumstances, the generation that we belong to, the culture that we belong to. You know, we, we are meant to, to, to be who we are, and yet we can still be like Christ. And so this is the, the beauty of the lives of the saints. And especially when we immerse ourselves in one of the modern saints, we really... Uh, sort of get a, a special, uh, you know, additional treat because they 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 speak very loudly to our circumstances and to our struggles and to our sufferings and trials and um, and so you know someone like Saint Pope Carolus the Sixth is is not far from us. You know, many of our parents may have known him or met him, if not for sure, our grandparents. You know, and um, in my own sort of love for the saint and desire to know more about the saint as a priest, I, I always make a point that when I meet any 
congregation member from any of the churches that I either served at or visit, you know, who's above the age of 70, you know, I'll always ask them, you know, did you meet, did you ever see Pope Krulus, you know, and, and, and most of the time it's yes, even if it was one meeting or a brief meeting or they, they saw him at a church and almost in all cases, there's, there's a story behind it. There's a beautiful story of that encounter. Um, and so what I've learned is that what's written in the books, what's collected in, in the stories is really just a very small percentage of the, the, the beautiful sort of legacy uh, of this great saint. And, and even the miracles are just a small percentage of, of, of what he accomplished and did by the grace of God. And just really, you know, you think about it, it's, it's, um, it's a very short period of time that he was the patriarch of the church, um, you know, from 1959 to 1971. And he himself reposed at a very young age. He was born 1902 and reposed in 1971. So he was only 69 years old, you know, and we, you know, were, were accustomed just to reading about some of our, you know, monastic fathers and, and mothers who, you know, reposed in their eighties and nineties and, we can only imagine what he would, what else he would have accomplished for the church if he had another twenty years, you know. But this is the uh, the will of God, of course. So you know the the lives of the saints um, show us this experiential theology, this uh, the theology that's lived, not not the, not theology that's theoretical or that we, you know, sort of relegate to like dogmatic truths, but. But it's 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 the living out of the Bible. It's it's really so again more incarnational, and and this is why it's so important for us to immerse ourselves in the in the lives and the writings of the saints. Um, so the the important thing in the spiritual life for us is that we always have a sort of you know point of reference, um, you know, someone or or um, you know a, a sort of reference point that we can turn to in our spiritual life that sort of helps us get back on track. And, you know, uh, perhaps someone like St. Pope Kirillus VI is, is that reference point for many of us in this generation. You know, we look to him to sort of get an, a, um, a, a sense of, you know, what is, what is orthodoxy? What is, what is orthodox spirituality? How is, how is spirituality supposed to be sort of this beautiful um, combination of liturgical life and personal interior life, you know, prayer, sacraments, um, all of these components that we see in his, in his life uh, become for us, again, a sort of uh, reference point that we can turn to. And, and so this is a, a great gift for the church to always have individuals that that we can turn to and, and sort of help us get back on track um and again especially when they are close to our generation and to our culture because you know they're, they're they they speak to us in a more intimate way and maybe even in a more dramatic way of what we're going through and what we're facing and they also remove sort of any excuses for us you know we can't say well you know these people lived in the third century the fourth century um but rather you know, th this is somebody who lived and and struggled within our own generation. So um, the next thing that I was thinking of is that like in a book like like mine, where you have all these stories, you know, some people sometimes um, I think might misunderstand really what's the point of all of these stories. You know, some some people, and of course, I respect everybody's opinion, but some people might say, oh, well, these are just miracles. And, and, and you know, there's kind of this um, opinions among some in the church, even among some of the the clergy, that you know, you know, we we emphasize miracles too much, and uh, but really, even though there's a lot of miraculous aspects to these stories, but that's not really the the point of the stories. I mean, if you if if you've gone through um, the book at all, you, you'll notice that almost 100% of the stories, with the exception of maybe two of the stories, are all stories when he was alive, which is really a small percentage of the miracles that are associated with his name because so many books relate stories of miracles that happened after his departure. But I didn't include those because what I really wanted to emphasize was this encounter, the encounter that people had with the saint. And in that encounter, if one sort of reads through these stories once, twice, three times, 
you pick up on little things that are part of that encounter, the kindness of the saint, the humility of the saint, the generosity of the saint, the, the humor of the saint, um, the, the sort of patience, you know, um, you, 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 you begin to tap into elements of, of these stories that are not about the miraculous, but are about his person. And, and that's what sort of attracts us to not only to him as a saint, but to imitate him, to follow him, you know, so that like St. Paul says, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Um, and so, and, and the encounter between the, the common person of the church who, who, you know, um, goes to see the Pope or, or, you know, runs into him at a service is sort of a symbol or um, a metaphor of, of our encounter with God. You know, that, that uh, we all are, are, are called to enter into a sort of regular encounter with Christ. You know, we can think about the Gospels are all about encounters, right? The encounter of Christ with the Samaritan woman, the encounter of Christ with Zacchaeus, the encounter of Christ with the blind man Bartimaeus, the encounter of Christ with, you know, each of his disciples in their own unique way. Uh, it, the, the, the Gospels are all about encountering Christ at an individual sort of personal level. And, and so a lot of these stories again, are sort of a symbol of that encounter, you know, and because a lot of these encounters that these people had with the saint were life-changing encounters, just like, you know, the encounter of the, the, the sinful woman with Christ was a life-changing encounter, the encounter with Zacchaeus with Christ was a life-changing encounter. And so, you know, when, when we see, you know, some of these encounters, um, again, they, they inspire us to seek those encounters with Christ on a regular basis, you know, for our ongoing conversion and, uh, and growth. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about was, you know, um, in Arabic, there is this phrase that um, he used to always say to people, you know, you Habib Abuk or you Habib Abuki, um, which literally it would be translated like, you know, the beloved of your, of your father. And, and so, you know, he was known for always addressing people in this way. And if, if any of you have heard some of my talks about Tan Samira, you know, very um, pious, beautiful, holy woman that, um, that reposed about five years ago, ha who knew him when he was alive and had this beautiful relationship with him, um, you know, she would say that that's always how he would address her, you know, and, and for many of us who have read the stories and talked to people who met him, we know that that was the case for almost everybody who encountered him. And so there's this constant reminder that he gives us of what our identity is, right? Who are we? We are the beloved of the father, right? And then in, in my book, that really is kind of the, the opening meditation. Um, so sorry, I will refer a little bit to some of the points in, in my book, just to, as, as sort of, again, points of reference, if you will. Um, but in that introductory hour of, of Psalm 50, uh, or the introductory Psalm, Psalm 50, before the first hour, the first entry is on divine filiation. And I, I sort of um, purposefully put it there so that it would, it would be a sort of theme for the, for the whole book. You know, that, that what draws us into spirituality and inspires us day after day to continue struggling to overcome our sins and our passions and to um, desire the, the virtues is this great gift that we have been given, you know, that we have been called into sonship, adoption. We have been called into this beautiful union with the family of the Trinity. Um, and we have been raised to this dignity that, that belongs only to us as children of God, you know, so we could think of sort of the all of creation is in, is in a sense um, a child of God. You know, uh, even the non the, the non believer is a child of God and, and bears His image. But those who are baptized and who have entered into uh, sort of the redemptive and salvific um, uh, victory of Christ are 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 raised to a completely different level of sonship, and and then. 
you know, in eternity, we will even discover another experience of what that sonship is like in glory. And so every time he says to us, the beloved of the father, we should, we should remember that our joy as Christians resides on this important truth. It doesn't, our joy doesn't come from, um, you know, simply overcoming um, our sins and, and uh, you know, sort of um, pushing ourselves to great ascetical feats of, of um, you know, human strength. But what, what helps us to always experience Christian joy is that sonship, that identity that we have, that can't be taken away from us. Uh, sin can't take that away from us, right? As we learn in the story of the prodigal son, the younger son learns and rejoices, of course, uh, in his return that he's still a son. He's not uh, a hired servant like he wants to be, but but he never lost his sonship, you know? And so that's, you know, sort of the theme of this book, you know, the father saying to the elder son, all that I have is yours, right? So this is this is where our joy finds its its foundation and its 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 center and its um, ongoing sort of strength in the midst of our sadness and our trials and difficulties is that we have this treasure that um, and this gift that can't be taken away from us. Um, so that's something that I think is very again central to his spirituality. You know, just in the in the way that he addresses us is that he's constantly reminding us of our identity. Um, and I remember a story Tan Samira uh, told me about, you know, uh, somebody who was struggling with, um, you know, with sin and with his weaknesses and things like that. And, and she went to him and, you know, and was um, asking him to pray for this person. And, and his response was, his problem is that he doesn't know who he is. And what he meant by that is that, is that he's, he's identifying himself with, his sins and his talents, his weaknesses and his strengths, but he doesn't really know who he is, who in that he is the beloved of the father. He is, he is the son of the, the great king. And if he understood that, you know, he wouldn't be so downtrodden all the time or, you know, sorrowful or. So I think it's a beautiful part of his spirituality that maybe we don't necessarily um, kind of pick up on. Um, the other point that I wanted to sort of reflect on with you um, is sort of this movement that we see in his life from what I call from the natural to the supernatural. And, and this goes to one of the important elements of his spirituality, which is a sort of Eucharistic spirituality, right? I mean, we all know that St. Pope Carlos VI was a man of prayer, especially the altar um, especially the divine liturgy, you know, every day of his life, um, even when he was in his last days and, and was told by the doctors that he shouldn't be praying and he insisted to, to stand at the altar and, and to offer the sacrifice of, of the Holy Eucharist. And, and so, again, you know, we could just stop there and say that he loved the liturgy, he loved taking communion, but, but I think that really it's, it's this Eucharistic spirituality is is something that really impacted every aspect of his life in the sense that, you know, the Eucharist, there's a, there's a chapter um, in, in the book on, um, uh, I think it's from Psalm 14, which is in the first hour, um, on the Eucharist in faith. And, and what, I, what I say here is that the Eucharist is sort of this school leading us to higher degrees of faith because every time we take communion you know we make an act of faith that this natural bread and wine that we see and taste and touch with with our senses is really the body and the blood of Christ right and so we're sort of we're sort of training ourselves in a spiritual sense of how to make this movement from the natural to the supernatural right how to go beyond the physical things that we see and, and touch and smell and taste to see the divine behind them, right? And this then impacts everything in our life, 
right? So that the Pope, and again, as something sort of characteristic of his spirit spirituality, is that he saw all of creation as sort of a, a sacrament of the divine, right? Now, one of the stories that I believe is in the book is about, you know, uh, a time when the Pope uh, was approached about a Catholic priest who was known to him, uh, somebody who was known to the Pope and was was at the point of death. And so, you know, they they rushed to the Pope to ask for his prayers. And he simply took a piece of, like, candy. Um, he unwrapped it. He put it in his mouth. He sucked on the candy. He put it back in the wrapper and then said, you know, have Father Victor, you know, suck on this candy and he'll be fine. Right. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. Right. And, and it's, it's sort of this almost, uh, you know, unusual story, you know, uh, I mean, maybe we're used to hearing him say, you know, take this oil, you know, this cotton that was dipped in, in say the vigil lamp of St. Mina's icon, you know, and anoint yourself or take this, uh, water that's been prayed on and drink it, but a piece of candy that he sucks on. Right. And so, you 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 see in him that nothing was a barrier to divine life. Even all of the creation he saw as good, as as ultimately something that can be useful and, and utilized in our relationship with, with God. And so that all of these things, whether it was water or oil or the bread of the baraka or the the hard candy that he you know sucked on in, in, in the case of this specific story, um that all of these things, because of his faith, you know, became vehicles of, of supernatural grace. And so, again, this is, I think, another important aspect of his spirituality that we can benefit from, is how, through the Eucharist, through all of the sacraments, to, to sort of make this continuous growth in the life of faith to see beyond the natural world, and to discover God, to discover the divine, it, of course, first and foremost, in one, in each one of uh, our, our companions, right? I, you know, each human person is is bearing this image of God, you know. And so, if we have that outlook of the natural to the supernatural, then how much will we honor one another, even even our enemies, because we will see in them something that is of divine origin, or of at least you know a divine stamp. Um, how much will we appreciate the creation and and the beauty of creation and see that as a sort of sacrament of God's love, you know, the beauty of creation. Um, and so everything becomes transformed. Everything becomes transformed as a means of seeing God and his goodness, his beauty, his love, his mercy, his compassion, his grace. And I think, again, this is something that is really central to the saint's spirituality is this movement from natural to supernatural, right? Then the next aspect of that, I would say, is, is how then the supernatural informs the natural, right? And, and the perfect example here is his, light, his, um, his attitude um, of forgiveness towards his enemies, towards, towards those who, were, you know, um, who tried to uh, hurt him or, or remove him from office or harm him in any way. And... Because again, when we think about something like forgiveness, oftentimes when we say, why should we forgive somebody? We sort of think of it in terms of a psychological benefit. You know, well, you forgive the person so that you don't, you know, so that you remain free, you know, so you maintain this sort of interior freedom within your heart, you know, or that you don't live with this bitterness or that, you know, and so we always kind of look at it again from this natural standpoint of, well, what are the benefits of forgiving somebody? But for the Pope, for the saint, again, he was his the natural sort of relationships that he had with people were always informed by this supernatural outlook. So for him, forgiveness was always an act of faith, you know. And so there's um, there's a um, a chapter on uh, on faith, or I'm sorry, on forgiveness um, in Psalm 62. Let me just real quick look at that because I wanted to read just. Part of um, so at the at the end of that meditation on Psalm sixty two in the sixth hour. Is it sorry, not sixty two. Which one is it? Yeah. 
sorry. I'm not finding it now, but um, let's see. Oh, here it is. Uh, so yeah, Psalm 62. Let's see. Page 32. Let's see. Yes, sorry. So on on um on this last um Let's see, where is it? Yeah, in that last paragraph I say, but lack of forgiveness is also a sign of a lack of faith. Refusing to forgive is a way of clinging to my rights and getting my due now because I really do not believe that God can do better for me. If I truly trust that God can and will bring good out of every situation, then I am free to let go and forgive with a peaceful heart. So I think, again, the source of, of his generous sort of forgiveness is not you know that he's somehow just protecting his his heart from you know bitterness and 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 so on but it's that he had such a faith such a trust in god that he knew that ultimately god could do much better by his forgiving and 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 not seeking any sort of retribution against those who were provoking him or or harming him um and it was that sort of supernatural outlook that made forgiveness for him sort of natural you know, and and so again, I think the life of faith, the life of of ultimate and total trust and surrender and abandonment to God, then sort of filters down into every aspect of our natural life, every aspect of our um, everyday experience. It again, the, you know, the natural transforms us to to see the natural is transformed for us to to enter into the supernatural. But once we experience that sort of supernatural life, then again changes how we look at natural life and how we look at sort of everyday life and experience. So I think, again, this is another really important aspect of his spirituality is, is how his elevated sort of life of faith and trust then was sort of incarnated in all of his daily interactions um, with, with people and, 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 and solving problems of the church and so on. Um, and then the, I think another thing that is really important in his life is sort of this interplay or this um, synergy between what um, what we call asceticism and and sort of a mystical life where 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 if we can define a mis the word mysticism of course is is a word that can carry many many different meanings depending on the context and and, and you know how it's being used. Um, but in Christian sort of theology and um, spiritual understanding, the, the mystical life is really just the interior life of God's action in the soul. And you know, so if we if we distinguish between asceticism and mysticism, we would simply say that asceticism is more of the focus on sort of the human effort, right? It's it's what we do through our fasting, through our vigils, through our um, you know, um, you know, struggling to 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 read and say our prayers and so on, and this is important, of course. But mysticism or the mystical life is sort of the yeast that's that's hidden and is at work that we don't see, right? And this is why it's so important. For example, um, when you think about something like confession, you know, you might you might go in to see a counselor. Um, you might go in to see a therapist and you walk out feeling amazing. You know, you feel very relieved. You feel very comforted and at peace. And you might go to confession and let's say you walk out and you don't have that same experience. But which, which, which one is, is more important and which one is actually the greater uh, work? We, we have to say confession because, because confession is a sacrament, right? I'm not, I'm not diminishing the work of therapists and counselors. I'm simply saying that that one takes place at at a purely sort of natural level, right? Working on sort of the mind and and the emotions, and and it's sensible. We can feel it, but the other one is more invisible. So so God is at work in the soul, 
through the act of repentance and confession and the absolution that's prayed over the person, God is working in that soul in a very powerful way, even though the, the person may not feel it, right? And that's the that's mysticism. Mysticism is sort of this this experience um, that is is not no is not experienced at the level of the senses, but is is really what helps us to mature into again uh, you know holy sanctified lives, and and so I think again um, this the saint Saint Pope Carolus VI is this beautiful example of this marriage between asceticism and mysticism right of of his you know pushing himself to do his part but but also accepting sort of again through the life of faith and trust and surrender um the work of god secretly and sort of um subtly taking place within within the soul and um i think this is a, again a very kind of important aspect of orthodox spirituality that we need to um be aware of and appreciate and cultivate you know we need to cultivate the 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 the, the trust that we have in the sacraments of the church the trust that we have in um what god is doing in us even when we don't sense it when we're at prayer when we're reading the bible when we are attending uh, services at church you know, again, we shouldn't judge the the effect of those activities simply by how we feel, whether even the feeling is something, you know, exalted, like, you know, having a vision or something, right? I mean, that's not the criteria of the work of God in the soul. Those things are only things that are experienced at the sensual level, right? That the senses of the sense of, of, of vision or the sense of feeling or touch or, or hearing or something like that. But the true work of the Holy Spirit is taking place subtly and quietly. And uh, it's not something, you know, like Christ said, that you, that you can't say about the kingdom of God that it's, it's here or there. It's, it's, it's within you. And it's, it's growing within each one of us in a way that we will not really see or understand until we enter into eternal life and, and begin to again, have this sense of what God was doing within each one of us. So I think um, the appreciation for this sort of work of God in the soul through the, the, the sacramental and liturgical life of the church is something that is very characteristic of him. So the, and then the last thing I'll, I'll mention just for the sake of time is um, uh, what I, uh, what I termed on, uh, I think it's, Psalm, twenty-two on self-forgetfulness, which is on page forty-five. Let's see. So. Um, I have this entry in uh, under in the third hour under Psalm 22 on self forgetfulness, you know, the, and this expression self forgetfulness is maybe not one that is is common to us, um, but I think it's a very sort of descriptive of his spirituality. Right, so many of the stories, and uh, in uh, probably you've come across them either in this book or many other books about him you know, are about sort of this life of self-forgetfulness, right? He's, he's resting in his room after a long, um, you know, day at, at prayer at, in the church. He's finally having a moment of rest, but somebody needs him. And so he's awakened, you know, by, by the Spirit of God or by St. Mina um, or by his own sort of spiritual intuition. And, and he, uh, he, he leaves his rest in order to go and serve this person, right? And, and, and this sort of pattern is repeated in so many of these stories, you know, this sense of self-forgetfulness where he has such a, an awareness of the needs of the others that he forgets his own needs. He forgets his own rest. He forgets his own food. He forgets, you know, his own, uh, you know, um, um, desires. You know, he, he forgets everything that is so sort of, natural for for us to be preoccupied with um because of his love for others and 
And so this this idea of self forgetfulness, I think, is is a very beautiful one that we can we see, of course, in the life of Christ. And there's a the good example of that. It would be, you know, when he takes the disciples for some needed retreat, rest. You know, he takes them to this deserted place, and the crowds of people follow. And so, sort of the his plans are sort of spoiled, and uh, and he. He begins to teach the people and then eventually he feeds them, right? The multitudes, the, the, the 5,000 um, households. And, you know, so this is an example of sort of how we can accept when, first of all, we can begin by just accepting when our plans are, are sort of spoiled. You know, we, uh, we wanted to, you know, sleep at a certain time, but, you know, our kids or our spouse or a service at church needs us, you know, or whatever it might be. And and sort of, you know, trying to resist this uh, need to, um, you know, always kind of hold on to our rights and hold on to our um, our needs and our desires, and to 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 try to sort of stretch ourselves a little bit in order to uh, forget ourselves, you know. And uh, you know, one of the things that I said in this um, chapter was. One of the saints said that to love is not difficult. We begin to love as soon as we cease to think of ourselves. Right? And, and that's such a beautiful thought that we begin to love as soon as we cease to think of ourselves. Um, and, and then that leads to my final point, which is another um, entry that I have on what I called um, spiritual generosity or generosity of spirit which again, I think a beautiful image of that is the sower. You know, Christ gives us the parable of the sower and, and the image that we can draw from that parable is sort of this sower, you know, who's got the bag of seed kind of thrown over his shoulder and he is sort of joyfully going through the fields and, and throwing the, the seeds everywhere with this joyful sort of anticipation of the harvest and he is just sort of throwing the seeds you know indiscriminately you know and 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 we know that many of the seeds don't fall on the good soil you know they fall on the bad soil but he's just throwing the seed everywhere with the hope of penetrating the earth and and it bearing fruit and so this is sort of an image of of i think the saint, the saint who, the specific saint who, who was just generous with himself, generous with his time, generous with his, um, with his talents, generous with his spiritual gifts of healing and, and, um, you know, uh, exercising demons and, and so on, generous with his forgiveness, uh, generous with his um, prayers, generous with his fastings, right? It just, he was always sort of thinking in excess of what we normally would would think in terms of offering to God and to one another. And, and so it, to me, it's, it's like this sort of indiscriminate, you know, spending of oneself um, for love, you know, because of love and for the sake of love. So I think, you know, again, these are two other maybe, you know, ways that we can describe his spirituality, you know, the self-forgetfulness and this generosity of, of spirit, um, you know, and, and we can do that in simple ways. We can, we can start with just sort of being generous with kindness, you know, I mean, Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to always talk about how important it is just to smile, you know, and how to sort of force yourself to smile more at, at, at others and, and how that affects people. So we can be, you know, we can try to practice that sort of generosity with with acts of kindness. With um, certainly, uh, we can try to do it with our forgiveness. We can try to do it with our time. You know, um, of course, there's we always talk about generosity in terms of material things. You know, giving money and so on. But but primarily, I'm thinking more in terms of you know sort of these immaterial aspects of of our spiritual life that we need to learn how to be generous with. So maybe this is a kind of a good place to to stop and um, hear any of your comments or thoughts or your questions. And thank you so much, Abuna. Uh, 
Yeah, if anyone has questions at church, uh, we can start with those. I apologize I couldn't be there this week with you guys uh, uh, in Ohio this weekend. <laughs> no worries, Mina. Thank you so much, Abuna, um, for sharing your thoughts and unique insights from having studied uh, the life of St. Paul Krilla so, so closely. Anybody here? Oh, Questions? Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Step up to the mic, Gabby. <laughs> so what I can hear. Thank you so much, Abuna. It's been so nice to hear like everything you've learned from um, like your studies into Bo Carlos's life. I was kind of wondering like where your journey began with um, learning about him and getting to know him better as a student. Yeah. Well, that's a bit of a long story. I'll try to summarize it as, as um, succinctly as I can. I mean, the short answer is that um, pretty much from my junior high through high school years, I was, you know, due to circumstances of where we happened to be living and, and due to my own sort of neglect of, of you know, caring for my, my, my spiritual life and my salvation, you know, uh, even against all the, the, the good intentions of my parents, I was really far from the church and far from really any sort of active spiritual life that, or any really active, good moral life. And, um, and I was a bit lost uh, until my, my freshman year of college. I was, uh, I was living away from home, uh, a couple thousand miles away from home, and really just sort of at a, a crossroads in my life in terms of not really have a, having a sense of meaning and purpose and understanding kind of, you know, where do I go from here? And, you know, and kind of having exhausted a, a life of fun and, uh, you know, let's say prodigal living. And um, I was sent a book, you know, my, my, my dad who reached out to a, a priest, this was in 1989. Um, at that time, the first book in English had been um, translated about St. Pope Krulus, um, his, uh, actually in, in my book, the, um, the reason why we included, I'll show you this picture. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Um, this was the cover picture of that book. It was the first volume of, um, the miracles of, of, uh, Pope Krulus the sixth. And I didn't know anything about him. I had never really I remember seeing a picture of him on my dad's desk at home, but I didn't never asked, you know, who he was or anything like that. And um, something in, in, in on that, I guess, for his picture sort of intrigued me. I mean, sort of a, uh, you know, he has sort of this austere, sort of awesome kind of look to him. And, and I, I must have just been curious enough to start reading a little bit of it. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to describe what happened but I had um, sort of the floodgates opened of, of repentance in my life. And um, it was a week of tears and a, a real change in my life that, that took place just from reading that small book. And it's one of those things that's very difficult to describe because it's, it's such a, a personal experience and, and you know, that it's, 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 you know, God sort of reaches into somebody's life at a certain moment and grabs hold of them. And it's, it's very hard to put into words what that experience is like, but for me, it was, it was a life changing moment in my life. My life completely changed instantaneously, really. And so that was sort of the beginning of me um, sort of being fascinated with, with him as a saint and wanting to, uh, you know, have a relationship um, with him as, as my patron saint and, and um, learning about him. And, and, and the, the, you know, I had a spiritual father right after that, actually, it was at the time it was sent as our new priest in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, who he passed away a few years ago. A, a few years ago, his name was Abu Namitias Fadil Wahba, um, who was from Figuela in Cairo, and he he was ordained in 1962 and was just down the street from the cathedral where the Pope was. And so, you know, he had nine years of of sort of experience with the saint, and he 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 loved him very much. And so, I sort of found a living disciple. Uh, 
or you know at least somebody who was a connection in real life and so abuna mitias became a huge influence in my life you know during my college and young adult years and and that's eventually what pulled me into service and eventually into priesthood so yeah i guess uh that's maybe the shortest version i can <laughs> thank you Abuna. I have like a million followers. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We, we have another one. I was, Gabby, you got one. You check anybody online, uh, those who have joined us online, anybody have a question? You can unmute yourself. And if not, Mina, I believe you had a couple questions lined up as well. Sure. Um, if, if no one else has a has a question, no, uh, this is my Mary Ann Slade Jeva. You do, but me can go ahead first. That's fine. <laughs> no, no, go, go ahead, Mary. Go ahead, go ahead Mary, sure. and then we'll get to Mina. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. Really inspired to have the relationship that you have with Pope Corollas, St. Pope Corollas, um, with him and all the saints. Uh, I have several questions, but I'll, I'll start with just. Um, I, I guess how, like practically, how can we, um, like, yeah, have that um, same sort of experience with the Eucharist and like that sacramental life? Like, like you said, I, I know, I think we we ache for there to for, to feel and to experience in tangible ways, but of course, it's it's beyond what's what we experience and what we feel. It's a more of a, a faith. Um, but yeah, I just yeah. No, it's a very good question, and you know, I think, I think you know, thank God that all of us at times we have experiences, you know, uh, and I don't mean you know experiences of like visions and things like that. I mean those are very rare, but but we have you know um, palpable joy, you know, palpable peace um, that at, at moments we experience in prayer, at liturgy, in in the sacrament of confession, and so on. But what I would say is that what's really important for us is to, is to sort of constantly cultivate, you know, this awareness of the love that's behind every sacrament. You know, if we imagine if we approach communion and instead of just taking it sort of as ritualistically as we often do and, you know, just kind of repeating the prayers, but we really for a moment, just, just for a moment before we actually take the body and blood of Christ into our, our own bodies if we if we meditate on the great love of God who gives Himself to us in this way, you know the great humility of God who who deemed Himself little enough to uh, become food for us, you know bread and wine that that we can chew, um, that we can approach so simply, you know and and. You know, I remember one of the spiritual fathers had this. He says, you know, this is a thought that we should sort of have with us is that don't take communion because, you know, it pleases you, but take communion because it pleases God who wants to enter into your life, you know. So those kinds of thoughts, I think, can help, you know, same thing with confession. You know, I'm not going to confession because I, you know, it's just a routine because I going to ask me why I haven't been there because I feel guilty. No, but, but the love behind it, right? Like, Christ, the, the 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 true sort of healer and physician of our souls, wants to remove from from my shoulders all the sorrow, all the guilt, all the the pain of my sins. You know, he he you know, and and if we can if we can listen to the words of the absolution and and be sort of again grateful for the love behind this gift of forgiveness and mercy. You know, I think that's what's important. You know, and and not so much again trying to cultivate feelings or or experiences, but but really just reflecting, meditating a little bit more on the love of God behind these gifts that He gives to the church, rather than them as commandments or as rituals or as sort of mandates that we have to do, but as gifts. You know, each one of us, I think, you know. It's, when you when you receive a gift and you know it's a gift and it's a precious gift right and it's something that you love right the experience of that is is 
bliss, joy, it's happiness, you know, it's gratitude. So I think we need to sort of shift our view of the sacraments and of, of liturgy and of everything in the church to see it as a gift, you know, to see it as a gift of love. I think if we do that, we will have a, a, a greater experience of, of um, you know, the, the life of the church. Thank you, Bonak. Mina, I remember you... very briefly, I'll just say about Tatan Samira. If you just mentioned the Eucharist to her, her eyes would, would widen and she would start to, you know, have this excitement of a child. And she, and, and, and she would almost be at a loss for words. And it, like, so sometimes I would just put her on the spot and I would say, Tant, talk to us about Holy Communion. And she, she would be like, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. It's fire. It's fire. It's you know, and she in 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 you know, in very simple words, but she would have this overwhelming sense of just the the magnitude of this gift, you know, and and she would she would be like a kid who's you know, um, you know, has this sort of you know, like buffet of candy, you know, um, experience, and and so I think this is again. Uh, a way that we can just start to change our our uh, approach. Sorry, somebody else was going to ask a question. Uh, no, I, I didn't have a question. I was going to ask Mina to to oh. share one of the questions he had uh, prepared. Sure. sure. Thank you, Abuna. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, this is a, like a small quote from Father Thomas Hopko. Just be simple, be hidden, be quiet, and be small. Um, and, you know, while this is actually my question, <laughs> while, you know, while I was reading uh, your book, Abuna, uh, it, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive to how a lot of folks kind of live life every day. Um, you know, they strive for greatness, they strive for accomplishment, for attention, notoriety, things like that. Um, my question is, you know, when we see Pope Carlos, St. Pope Carlos in that light, you know, can you speak to a little bit about why that's important um, and how, uh, how we can learn from, from kind of like him through that? Because he, he obviously was in that sense, you know, always thought of sure. himself small simple hidden quiet yeah and if you read the book by abuna daniel Fanus, you know you you get a, a greater sense of course of how much he he longed for the life of solitude and really to be sort of hidden from the world and to to not be known by anybody but but to sort of just be known to god alone and um so i think it is it is characteristic of his spirituality and at the same time, you know, as he's called into this um, role of, of patriarch, he accepts it and he accepts it not by, I mean, of course, he continued to, to live um, aspects of solitude in his life by retreating to the, to the monastery and so on. But he also came out of that solitude, even when he was in the, in the windmill, um, you know, he was, you know, as Abuna Daniel called him, this urban ascetic or this urban hermit who who balanced between solitude and, and interacting with the world. And I think that's a good um, sort of, uh, you know, two realities that we always have to, um, for those of us living in the world, we have to practice, and of course, in a smaller degree than him. We, we all have to have our time of solitude. We all have to have our hidden time. We all have to have our secret life with God that's, that nobody knows about. We all have to have, the good deeds and the, and the sacrifices that we make that are never recognized in this life, you know, um, be, because those, those are like, um, you know, precious fragrant, you know, fragrant perfume that, 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 um, you know, reaches the heavens. And, you know, when, when we expose, of course, our inner life too much, then, then we lose some of that, um, intimacy with God. And, you know, but at the same time, you know, we, we, we can't shy away from what God has called us to do in our service, 
in our interactions with the world, in our in our um, you know uh, relations with one another, in our talents and gifts that he's given us for the edification of the church, right? All of these talents that he had, right? The especially the supernatural gifts of healing and and clairvoyance and um, you know casting out demons, all of this was not for him. You know, he himself suffered physically and was not healed of blood clots, and he ultimately died of a heart attack. And you know, but but it was for the edification of the church, for the building up of the church. You know, and so he knew that all of this was not sort of just the, a reward for his personal sanctity, but but he was sort of just the steward of these um, of these gifts of God that God wanted to give His church through him because of his humility. His humility was was such that he was able to bear those gifts. Uh, without them destroying him, you know. Um, so, um, so, so he is a, a wonderful example of of sort of this combination of solitude and, you know, interactivity with with the world. And I, think both, um, and as a matter of fact, as one spiritual father said, uh, Father Zechariah Zachru, who is um, a Greek spiritual father who I love very much, and some of his writings are are I highly re recommend them. Um, he said, you know, unless we have our sort of our, our silent solitude and intimate time with God, then our time with, and especially in service towards others will be sort of, um, clumsy, you know, um, unless we struggle with God, you know, behind closed doors, then when we speak to somebody else who's suffering, when we try to offer a good word, when we try to serve our Sunday school kids, when we try to serve as clergy, uh, all of our words and actions will, will be clumsy, you know? And, and so I just love how he sort of expresses this idea of, of you know, this, this sort of hidden life is the source for our public life, right? And we see that in Christ too. Christ spent 30 years in obscurity, 30 years in, in, in Nazareth doing very common human work and living a very common human life you know, with a family. And, and he sort of sanctified that hidden life. Um, but then he came out of that hidden life in order to serve humanity. And, and, you know, and so we have to have, I think, those two realities. And, you know, sometimes it's a struggle and there's tension there, but, you know, through guidance that we can get through the, our spiritual father and, and the examples of the saints, we can, we can try to have that balance and, that, and to live in that tension in a healthy way. Thank you, Abuna. I think we got one more here um, for you, and then I think our time is going to come to an end, but I feel like we can go on for quite some time. <laughs> I'll just one more, but it's kind of hard. I feel like I want to ask you about Tosmia, um, but also about like how uh, St. Pilcarillus like maybe challenged a way that you saw something in the church. I don't know if um, maybe like you have an example of something like since Vera had like taught you about from him in that way. Um, well, in terms of Tansimira, I mean, there's a couple of really good talks that were, were given at our parish by, um, by uh, uh, Mariana Maximus, who was somebody who was also very close to Tansimira. You can, I can send links to, to Abuna for those. There's a talk that I gave sort of kind of, um, without preparation at the convent, uh, a few years back that's on my SoundCloud that I can send, which has a lot of stories with Tansimira. And, uh, and, um, I know that that talk has sort of made its rounds and that's how a lot of people have heard about Tansimira. So if you don't have that, I can, and there's also a talk of Tansimira herself many, many years ago at one of our women's meetings. And she sort of talks a lot about her life and, and gives advice to the young ladies about marriage and family life. So, so there's probably some good um, things there that I can send to Abuna um, to distribute for those who want to know a little bit more about her. Um, in terms of, you know, things through Tansimira that sort of challenged my, um, I, I would say that the one thing that I, um, that I I received a lot from Tansimir was the importance of living from the heart. Um, how do I describe what I mean by that? I mean, she would always say, when you preach, preach from your heart. When you pray, pray from your heart. You know, 
Um, and, and this is what, you know, she would always relate in terms of um, sort of her experience and her um, knowledge of, of Pope Krolos that was something very important, you know, is, is sort of living from the heart. And um, so I, I think, you know, again, you know, he, of course, he was a very uh, ascetical, he was very liturgical, but that's not, you know, when you, when you ask Tansimir about what he was like one-on-one, -on -one, she would say he was like a child, you know, he was very simple. Um, and, you know, I mean, one of the stories in the book is, uh, that I mentioned about her is, you know, when she was having breakfast with him once and he was peeling an egg for her. And, you know, he took this tremendous amount of time to peel the egg sort of meticulously. And, and then after he peeled it and he sort of kind of kept looking at it and brushing off any, you know, remaining, you know, particles of the shell. And then he just held it up and he, and he kept turning it. And then he, he said to her, do you see how much God loves us? You know? And so he had this um, sort of simple, beautiful sense of, um, you know, wonder, you know, there's a, there's a chapter in the book on wonder and, um, you know, so I, I would say, you know, this sort of, you know, living from the heart, you know, like, which is what children do. Children, you know, live from the heart and, and, and they speak from the heart. And, you know, sometimes as adults, we, 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 we lose that sense of living from the heart and we, we tend to be more in, the, in our headspace and our mind and we, we calculate things so much and we, you know, and I think um, if we just learn to, to pray from the heart, to, to, to speak from the heart, even in very simple ways, it's, it seems to be more pleasing to God. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's a very good question. I have to give it some more thought. I'm sure there's many things that I, I learned um, from her, you know, and there are many stories of small things that I, I, I definitely gained from her relationship with, with what she, she would always call him just Baba. Um, so I, I can give some more thought to that and maybe in another time we can explore that a little bit more. Thank you, everyone. I got one more request for another question. Do you have time for it? I'm okay, as long as you are, sure. That's all right. We can manage Vespers, not a problem. All right, we got one more from online. Oh, uh, you're muted. Sorry. Huh. Hello. Hi, Buna. Hi, Nancy. I'm with Joy, and she has a question, actually. Okay. Hi, Joy. Hello. Um, what would you tell someone who is having trouble finding a purpose in life and asks you what is the purpose of life and like how would you respond to them? Well, it's it's hard to answer that question because you know um, that person who's asking that has a very specific reason why they're asking that question, right? And there could be a lot of pain in their life. There could be things that happened in their childhood, they, there could be loss that they're, you know, grieving, you know, there could be, um, addic I mean, there could be many things that are leading them to ask, ask that specific question. But I mean, um, you know, kind of going back to something that I said in the beginning about, you know, the very first um, chapter in the book on divine filiation, you know, um, what is our greatest identity, you know, maybe is, or what is, what is our prime identity? It's not, you know, that I'm a priest or somebody's a doctor or engineer or even a husband or a father, but our, our sort of most important identity is that we're children of God. And as children of God, we, right, we, hear, we hear the words of, of the father in the story of the prodigal son to the elder brother when he says to him, all that I have is yours. You are with me always and all that I have is yours. So what is the greatest joy of our life? It, it's, it's our identity as children of God in whom God wants to give us everything in eternity, his glory, his eternity, his, his love, his, his, his glory. Um, you know, that's why it's interesting. I was preaching on, on the Ascension and uh, one of the quotes that I came across said, you know, that, that some of the fathers considered the ascension the greatest of the feasts, you know, even greater than the resurrection, because because the ascension sort of celebrates um, the exaltation of man. The ascension celebrates, you know, man being 
you know, glorified and sitting at the right hand of the Father, you know, that, that Christ took our humanity and placed it there. And it's a beautiful thought because, you know, we're not just escaping death. We're not just escaping hell. You know, that's not the purpose of, of, of our Christian life. But it's it's this true exaltation to to enter into the very life of God Himself and to and and to enjoy the benefits of what what that means, you know. So I think if we if we had a a better idea of what Christianity actually is all about and and you know what it is that we are called to, um, maybe that question would would lose some of its potency. You know, we would we would have a better sense of what our purpose is. You know. Because it's not our purpose is not that we have to find this career or that career or to go to this school or that school. Those are all wonderful things and can be parts of our journey. But our total, our ultimate sort of purpose and, and destiny is that realization of what it means to be a child of God, you know, here and in eternity. You know, it's uh, St. John says, you know, now we are sons, you know, now we are children of God, but we don't know what we will be. You know, so if if as baptized Christians we are already identified as children of God with all of these wonderful benefits, he's basically saying there's more to come. The the best hasn't yet happened. You know, so we live in that anticipation also of of what eternal life has in store for us. What eye has not seen or ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. Um, so I don't know. Those are some some simple thoughts on that. Um, thank you, Abona. I honestly really can't thank you enough for, for joining us. Um, you know, I'm sure you have a busy schedule, but it, it meant a lot to to hear from you and your intimate uh, experience with, with St. Paul Perlis. So we thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and if you ever find yourself on the East Coast at any time, like please. Uh, I would love to take the blessing. By. Thank you. Um, we would love to have you at any time, but um Again, thank you. And if you would please just close us in prayer, we would love your blessing. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. I mean, finally, Lord, we thank you for all things. And we thank you for the blessing of our time together. We ask you, Lord, to grant us again to bear fruit in our lives through all the wonderful gifts that you have given to us through your holy church. Bless all your children standing in front of you, each one by his or her name through the intercessions of the Most Holy Mother of God, St. Mary, St. Pope Grullus, and the blessing of my Father, Abun and David. And hear us when we pray, thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Absolve me, Abuna. Pray for me. Thank you, Abuna, so much. Thank you all. Keep us in Thank your Thank you. Prayer.